Hello, we are back. Um, English, so we transition now. And then after Paul, we are going to move into Portuguese. So we are going to have amazing Hello, back. speakers from, um, from Brazil. English. So it's, it's an amazing pleasure for me to introduce uh, our next uh, wise man, is Paul Atkins. Uh, he's now a member of the World Happiness Board, a psychologist and probably the, one of the top experts in the world, uh, I would say, and founder of ProSocial, co-founder of ProSocial. And, you are, and he's going to explain us what, what that is. So thank you so much, Paul, for, for joining us. Uh, we've been learning uh, so much today about belonging, about what it takes to belong. Uh, we, are, we want to learn more about how groups are built. So this is your, this is your focus. <laughs> so how do we create communities of practice? How do we actually maximize the impact of um, of in this case, and this is the way we are framing as well our government session, the power of pro-social. So it'd be great to that we understand, and then we are going to have some more time uh, in a workshop uh, space after we talk, so people can join longer. But why don't we focus these uh, 20, 25 minutes on what is what is professional? What is the high level? What does it mean? Um, I mean, you have the wisdom, so let's let's learn from from the source. Welcome. Thank you so much, Louise. Can you hear me? Okay. Great, wonderful. Um, well, I'm speaking to you from the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people's land in Australia, the local indigenous peoples that were here before, long before my uh, ancestors were. And uh, I mention that because I think that uh, it's highly relevant to the, the idea of belonging, not only belonging to uh, groups, but also to the land, to place. Thank you very much, Luis, for, uh, for introducing me. Um, if I could have the first slide, please. Um, so I'm a organizational psychologist and a change maker, and uh, I'm most interested now in helping groups to uh, grow and to thrive, and in particular to create groups that are um, where everybody's individual autonomy is respected, but there's a sense of alignment of purpose and where there's a strong sense of um, belonging, but also a, a strong sense of power with in the culture so that uh, everyone's needs are included and involved. Next slide, please. Maybe I can wave my hand or something. So we're really interested in how can we build groups and groups of groups where everyone's needs are considered. This is in the pro-social project that we're engaged in. Next, press forward, please. Uh, and what that actually means is it's groups and groups of groups doesn't really sound all that sexy, but what we actually mean by that is a world uh, bottom up where we can build many small groups. Next slide, please. For at least 41 years, we've been telling ourselves the story that uh, we're actually quite selfish. Uh, and that being selfish is not only natural, it's good. I say 41 years because that's the year that Margaret Thatcher was elected. And she's famous for saying, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are families and it's our duty to look after ourselves. It's the greed is good ethos that's underpinned neoliberalism and austerity. And it's led to a particular type of view of humanity as homo economicus, we're inherently separate, self-interested, and all we're about is maximizing our own utility. Next, please. But in actuality, can you play this video? In actuality, um, all you need to do is systematic research on either 
tribes people around the world uh, and also looking in the historical record you can see evidence from uh, small groups all around the world that um, the tribes people generally speaking lived in conditions reasonably egalitarian and highly cooperative we totally evolved in that space the other place that you can look for evidence that the homo economicus story is wrong is with um, little babies and toddlers. And uh, this is a famous series of studies that were done by Warnikin and Tomasello, um, where they put toddlers in situations where the, the adult actually needed something of some sort. In this case, you know, I've dropped the pig and the little boy there goes over and picks it up and <laughs> struggles to sit up and then gives it. And this is all pre-linguistically. This is before they've even um, had any influence from society. Well, they've had some influence from society, but you can actually track back to even babies of six months uh, will have preferences for helpful characters in a puppet show over unhelpful characters. Next slide, please. So the, 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 the reason I'm telling you all this is because our beliefs about other people really matter and the narrative that we've been pushing in our society that we're all um, self-interested and that we're all separate from one another has real impact. This is a study done by the Common Cause Foundation in the United Kingdom. And what they showed was that uh, voting behavior where um, you, to, to the extent that people thought that uh, others were selfish, that's on the left-hand side, um, they were less likely to vote. And to the extent that they thought that others were more compassionate, they were more likely to vote. This is a very large sample of people across the United Kingdom. Not only that, um, the, to the, to the more you think others are selfish, not only are you less likely to vote, you're less likely to volunteer, you're less likely to feel responsibility for your community, and the more likely you are to be socially alienated, to not belong. We've all been caught in a kind of story, a kind of zero-sum game that's made it completely naive in some ways for us to focus on uh, how can we share resources more effectively. So next slide, please. What's an alternative? Next slide. Well, one part of what we need to do is tell a different story from that which we've told in the past. The homo economicus worldview it was actually born in a particular parable uh, developed in 1968 by a man called Garrett Hardin in a science article. And it's come to be known as the tragedy of the commons. You're probably familiar with this term. It simply means the idea that if we have a common pool resource, a shared resource, that human beings by their very nature will inevitably exploit it until it's all gone. So he talked about the example, for instance, of a, a field with cows on it and invariably individual herders would put more and more cows on there until all the grass was gone and it was denuded. He said, an unmanaged commons in a world of limited material wealth and unlimited desires inevitably ends in ruin. But even in that short sentence, there are so many incorrect assumptions about human beings. The idea that humans are actually totally individual, that they don't cooperate or communicate. The idea that they're seeking to maximize their own ends and that they don't value others. The idea that they have unlimited desires. The idea that the world is actually a, a world of scarcity um, when in fact our lived experience is that the world is more often can be seen as a world of great abundance of far more than what we truly need. Even the idea that we can't be trusted is built into this statement. 
And so Hardin's conclusion was, was that we needed governments to coerce us to tell us what to do. Top-down regulation was the only way that we could deal with the tragedy of the commons. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the other alternative that people propose, of course, to deal with the tragedy of the commons is to own things, to have private markets and private ownership. And if you own something, then the idea is you'll look after it and monitor it more effectively. Eleanor Ostrom, a political scientist, won a Nobel Prize in 2009 for her work uh, really debunking, essentially, the tragedy of the commons story. I should say, the tragedy of the commons is not just a paper from 1968. It's actually taught as truth. Even in, if you went and did a first year economics class today, you would be taught the tragedy of the commons in most economics textbooks and most economics classrooms. And there's really good evidence, just to add to what I said earlier, that uh, economics students become less pro-social when they learn that story than they were previously. They'll actually be less kind to their classmates. So Eleanor Ostrom uh, has a huge body of work for which ultimately she won the Nobel Prize in 2009. And she was studying groups all around the world. Um, and she sort of said, well, hang on a minute, this is just a story. Let's look at what people actually do. And of course, under the right conditions, human beings are enormously cooperative and they can manage the commons sometimes for hundreds or even thousands of years. So she framed up the commons as a, as a kind of third way of organising, if you like, that's different to top-down coercion and bottom-up individualistic markets. Next slide, please. And this matters because for human beings, the stories that we tell are at least as important as the physical structure of the world. I love this quote. I don't entirely agree with it. I think that the universe is also made of atoms. But for human beings, it's really the stories that we tell that determine our future. Next slide, please. And most of you may be familiar with this idea of two wolves, the story of um, an old Cher Cherokee um, teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil, he's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, and so on. The other is good, he's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. Which wolf will win, says the grandson? the one you feed, and it's the one we feed in our society that will win, whether it's homo economicus or this story of possibility that we can actually organise and share and create groups where people belong. Next slide, please. So let's get down to specifics. How do we create groups that belong? Well, part of what we're trying to do is to create groups that are about partnership rather than domination cultures. This language of domination and partnership is language from a woman called Ryan Eisler, E-I-S-L-E-R, and she spent her life studying um, uh, human relationships and it, her work um, really articulates, is brilliant work that articulates um, some of the key leverage points in societies for moving towards more of a partnering culture rather than a coercive domination culture. If we could have the next slide, please. So what I mentioned this term power with, what do I mean by that? I love the definition of power as the capacity to mobilize resources to attend to needs. Now, and then you can mobilize resources to attend to your own needs, or you can mobilize resources to attend to the needs of others as well as your own, both. And power over is when we mobilize resources to meet our own needs, it tends to be coercive. Whereas power with is about meeting others' needs as well as our own. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier that under the right conditions, 
people can be incredibly cooperative. Austin developed eight core design principles, and these are the heart of the pro-social approach to building more effective groups where everybody's needs are met. The most important one by far is building a sense of shared identity and purpose. And in the next workshop, I'll be talking about how you can do that. But these other principles are also really critical. We need to uh, ensure equity within the group, making sure that uh, everyone's needs matter, building a win-win culture where, um, where there's an emphasis on the needs of everybody in the group having their, um, having their needs at least considered. We need to engage in inclusive decision-making. So a lot of our work is about teaching, for instance, consent-based decision-making approaches. We need to encourage transparency uh, so that people can see what others are doing in the group. They can see that they're sticking to agreements. Uh, we need to be able to respond to one another in a graduated way that's appropriate to context. And that means includes uh, responding to bad behaviour. There's really clear evidence that groups that don't have graduated sanctions for misbehaviour are not safe for people. They don't feel psychologically safe. They feel uh, people don't trust those sorts of groups. So we need to be able to start with a very low level of sanctions. You know, um, Luis, I noticed you weren't doing what we agreed you'd do. Um, what was going on for you? And then be able to go right through to expulsion from the group. Um, actually excluding someone from a group is a really key part of building groups where people feel they can belong because we cannot always include everybody if they're not aligned with the purpose or if they don't have the skills to engage in the group's cooperation. We need to be able to manage conflict effectively in a fast and fair way. And we need to be able to give the group... The, the last two principles are about... Um, the external relations uh, of these are Ostrom's principles adapted slightly for pro-social. Um, the last two are about how the group relates to other groups. And what's really key is that um, the group needs to have enough authority to manage itself to be able to implement these first six principles. So uh, groups that are uh, in very heavy bureaucracies, for instance, often don't have the authority to do the first six principles. And the last principle is basically, it's called, Ostrom called it polycentric governance. It's the idea that the group, that there can be high quality relationships with other groups, between groups and that they embody the very same principles. So we need to have shared identity and purpose between groups. We need to have equity between groups. We need to have inclusion in decision-making between groups. And so you can reapply all of those earlier um, principles one to seven at the next level up. And this is where our, I think this is the unique piece of our model is that we're interested in every scale of groups. We're interested in what goes on inside a person. We're interested in uh, small groups. We're interested in groups of groups and whole societies. And our work is on all of those fronts. Next slide, please. And so we work with groups to map out how well are you doing on each of these principles. Next slide, please. And then discuss that. But another key part of what we do is building from the inside out. And we're using an approach called acceptance and commitment training or acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a uh, behavior change approach that has as its center the idea of being present, open and aware, and doing what really matters. Next slide, please. And so we have a tool that allows us to explore our inner sense making and what people are bringing to the group because what's really clear is that you cannot transform groups just by um, imposing or even developing agreements. Those eight core design principles are important, but they can be applied rigidly or they can be applied in a way that softens the attachment to the ego and um, is 
open and aware of others in the group. And so this inner work is absolutely critical. And this is one of our main tools for doing some of that inner work. I won't explain it here, but if you come to the workshop afterwards, uh, I'll tell you how to use this tool. That's what this workshop following up will be all about this tool. Next slide, please. Uh, so some key leverage points that we see for change, uh, um, a more accurate story of human prosociality, more shared identity, purpose and trust, education, including inner work to enhance conscious cooperation with all those principles that we were talking about, uh, policies that support autonomy, but in the context of the good of the group, it's this adult development idea that um, in order we can't ever um, remove selfishness, but what we can do is we can transcend selfishness and include it in a bigger context, a bigger context that includes what's good for the for the whole, what's good for the system, and that's what we're trying to build. That in effect leads to more effective local groups and networks of groups and more pro-social, compassionate behavior that enhances belonging. Thank you, next slide, please. If you'd like to learn more, uh, there's a book called Pro-Social uh, that I wrote with my colleagues, David Sloan Wilson and Stephen Hayes. There's a website, www.prosocial.world. And there's facilitator training that we do to help people learn to apply the pro-social method. And that's at those pages. I'm sure these slides will be made available to people. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up now, but I wanted to make it really clear that we're operating on a global scale. And so fortunately I've, um, come along with a friend, Claudia Ramirez, and I have a video from another friend, Michelle Taminato, who are both working in Latin America. Um, and I'd like to first of all, just show the video and then hand to Claudia for just a moment to say a few words. So the next slide has a short video from uh, Claudia, uh, from Michelle about her work on pro-social Brazil. So if you're in Brazil, this will be of particular interest to you. Oh, no audio. Uh, we might just go to Claudia for a moment and see if we can sort out the audio there for that one. Uh, Claudia, are you able to come on uh, on screen? Hi, do, do you hear me? Yes, yeah, go right ahead. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great presentation. Uh, well, hello, everybody. My name is Claudia Ramirez. I'm part of ARCA, an organization focused on cultural evolution, transformation, and political innovation here in Latin America. We're very happy to be working along with Paul and David in bringing for social for the Spanish speaking world. We're very aware of the relevance of, of this knowledge. And, you know, mainly in times like this, uh, the ones that we're facing now as humanity, in which the challenges we're facing can only be resolved by understanding them as challenges of the commons. And ProSocial gives us a key approach for it. Part of our contribution is that we're currently developing a way to implement the core design principles by applying Sociocracy 3.0 in a project called Asuncion Plus B, which is part of the Cities Can Be movement, uh, and also translating uh, the, the material so that it could be available for our Spanish speaking friends. Thank you very much, Claudia. Wow, Thank you, Paul. It's, it's so exciting to be working with you. I'm really delighted that you're able to come along. Um, I, I know we're on a very tight time frame here, so I'm just going to jump to um, to uh, to Michelle's work um, briefly, and um, I'm just going to share screen. <laughs> Good heavens! Here we go. We're going to share this one. I'm, this is the first time I've used share screening. Uh, can you see that? Okay, can you see Michelle there? Um, I'm going to just assume that the answer is yes. And oh gosh, there we go. So 
So I'm hoping you could see that okay. Uh, the sound is off. Uh, okay. Um, that's okay. Uh, Michelle was sharing the idea of pro-social Brazil. Yeah, we'll come back to Luis. Um, pro-social Brazil is an initiative that uh, um, Michelle is running and she's uh, very keen to um, engage anyone who's in Brazil and her email well, actually, I'll just, you can contact me, paul at paul.atkins at prosocial.world. Okay, thanks very much. Brother, <laughs> it was fantastic. Well, um, this, this is a public invitation to all the our hosts uh, out there uh, to look really, really deep into prosocial. We've been talking, Paul and I, we've been talking for for a long time, how do we actually get trained everybody on on this type of um, on this methodology? is is just fascinating. So we are gonna move now uh, into the workshop, uh, and Paul is gonna be waiting there. So you are all invited to those who are following on Hopping. You are on social media. Please come back to the event uh, or go to the recordings. But you are more than invited to go through the process. Uh, and, and we're gonna learn quite a lot about groups and how groups belong. So thank you, Paul, again, it's always fascinating learning from you and I'll see you soon on the other room. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Louise. And bye for now, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>